Welcome to the first Dr. Crunch podcast. We'll kick off with a very common exam topic, aortic valve disease. In this podcast, I will consider what the aortic valve normally does. I will then consider the causes of aortic stenosis and aortic regurge. I will then talk about the history, examination findings, investigations, and management of the two diseases. I will then present the case like you should in OSCEs or PACES. The aortic valve usually has three cusps. Its purpose is to allow blood to flow from the left ventricle to the aorta during systole and to close swiftly during diastole to prevent backflow. Aortic stenosis is an outflow obstruction during systole of the aortic valve. The most common cause overall is age-related calcification. The next most common cause overall is a bicuspid aortic valve. The extra turbulence generated by only having two cusps leads to local destruction and subsequent fibrosis, which can lead to stenosis or regurgitation, but more commonly stenosis. A bicuspid valve is also associated with aortic dissection, aneurysm and coarctation. For a way of presenting the cases in an examination, you could list them by age as follows. In children, consider congenital aortic stenosis and Williams syndrome, which causes a supravalvular stenosis. If the patient is less than 50 years old, think of rheumatic fever, or though this is getting rarer. If the patient is 50 to 65, think of a bicuspid aortic valve. And if the patient is over 65, it is almost definitely due to calcification. A rare cause in any age is obstructive vegetations, such as in infective endocarditis. Infective endocarditis tends to cause valve regurgitation rather than stenosis. Now, aortic sclerosis is defined as valve thickening with no outflow obstruction. It's probably part of a spectrum where the thickened calcified valve of aortic sclerosis will eventually obstruct the outflow, and then it will develop into aortic stenosis. Aortic regurgitation is an incompetence of the valve that allows blood to flow back down into the left ventricle from the aorta during the start of diastole. Causes can be classified for the sake of examinations into acute and chronic. Acute causes include infective endocarditis, aortic dissection, and rheumatic fever. Chronic causes are best remembered in pairs. These include real connective tissue diseases such as Marfan's, Ehlers Danlos, and the sore cold uh, connective tissue diseases such as SLE and RA, rheumatoid arthritis. It includes the seronegative arthropathies such as ankylosing spondylitis and Reiter syndrome, as well as oddities such as syphilis and Takayasu. Either of the valvulopathies can be asymptomatic. As they progress, they become more symptomatic. The key features on history for aortic stenosis are angina, syncope, and heart failure. Angina occurs when there is a mismatch between demand and supply in the heart tissue. In aortic stenosis, it occurs due to having a combination of increased oxygen demand from the heart having to work against a greater afterload, as well as a decreased oxygen supply from the fact that the maximum cardiac output is more limited than normal because of the outflow obstruction, which in turn limits coronary perfusion. There is a 50% survival after five years of untreated aortic stenosis with angina. Syncope also occurs due to the limited maximum cardiac output and is therefore more likely to occur during exertion. There is a 50% survival at three years with untreated aortic stenosis with syncope. Heart failure in aortic stenosis leads to diastolic dysfunction. There is a 50% survival at two years with untreated aortic stenosis with heart failure. Symptoms of heart failure include shortness of breath, tiredness, edema, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and orthopnea. Aortic regurgitation, when symptomatic, will present with features of heart failure. I will talk through the examination findings in the order you would do the examination. On inspection, there may be signs of heart failure 
with a breathless patient, there may also be eponymous signs of aortic regurgitation. Take a quick look at Quinky's pulsation of the nail bed. Let de Mosset blow his trumpet, nodding his head in time to the beat. Corrigan's is visible pulsations of the carotids. If you were shot in your femoral, you would be in trouble. So, trobes is a pistol shot sound heard over the femoral. So, once again, nail bed, Quinky's. De Mosset with his trumpet, he's nodding his head. Corrigan's is the carotid, and trobes is the trouble with the pistol in the femoral. The pulse of aortic stenosis is known as pulsus parvus et tardis, which means small and slow. This reflects the narrow pulse pressure caused by the limited cardiac output. The pulse of aortic regurgitation is a bounding or collapsing pulse. I find that no one really knows how to examine for the collapsing pulse, so I did some research. The logic is that if you palpate the brachial artery, you should feel a collapsing pulse anyway because of the widened pulse pressure. If you want to exaggerate this, and if you raise the arm, provided the diastolic pressure is low enough, you may effectively drain quite a lot, a lot of the blood back down the subclavian artery during diastole. This will make the rush of blood under high pressure at the start of systole all the more palpable, and the pulse will collapse from very strong during the start of systole to non-existent very quickly as the blood drains back down the arm. Palpation. Long-standing aortic stenosis will have a heaving, non-displaced apex reflecting a left ventricular hypertrophy. You may also feel a thrill over the aortic region. Long-standing aortic regurgitation will have a displaced apex reflecting left ventricular dilatation. The A2 component of the second heart sound will be quieter as the aortic stenosis progresses. This reflects the fact that the calcified valve cusps become less mobile as calcification progresses, resulting in quieter sounds as they come together than in the non-calcified state. The murmur is ejection systolic in nature. It is most commonly heard loudest in the aortic region, though it can be heard loudest in the tricuspid region. The more severe the stenosis, the later the peak of the crescendo-decrescendo murmur. This reflects the greater ventricular pressure needed to build up to overcome the aortic valve resistance. The differential of an ejection systolic murmur includes aortic stenosis, aortic sclerosis, hockham, a flow murmur, and pulmonary stenosis. Aortic stenosis can be differentiated from the others as follows. Radiation to the carotids is a hallmark of aortic stenosis and not sclerosis. The Valsalva maneuver decreases the intensity of the aortic stenosis murmur. This is in contrast to hockham. A flow murmur has no peripheral signs of heart disease, becoming louder in the supine position with no palpable thrill. Pulmonary stenosis will be louder in inspiration, in contrast to aortic stenosis, which is louder in expiration. Aortic regurgitation is a much quieter murmur. It is an early diastolic murmur, heard best leaning forwards in expiration. There is radiation to the left, lower sternal edge. In theory, you may also hear an Austin Flint murmur, which is when the turbulent jet of blood flows over the anterior mitral valve leaflets, providing a mitral stenosis-like mid-diastolic murmur, save for the opening snap, which would not be present in this case. In reality, you are far more likely to actually hear a coexisting aortic stenosis murmur, as aortic regurg often coexists with aortic stenosis. To distinguish which is the dominant murmur, you look at the peripheral signs such as blood pressure and pulse character. Investigations and management. An ECG may show left ventricular strain in aortic stenosis. The most important investigation is a cardiac echo, which can quantify the degree of stenosis or regurgitation. In aortic stenosis, look at the pressure gradient across the valve. Mild is less than 20 millimeters of mercury, severe is more than 40, and anything else is moderate. Any symptomatic patient or asymptomatic patient with a gradient more than 50 millimeters of mercury should ideally have the valve replaced. Minimally invasive surgery involves three inch incisions made in or to the right of the sternum and is now the most common approach for isolated heart valve surgery. Balloon valvuloplasty is an option for patients not fit for a valve replacement with a short expected lifespan 
as the recurrence rate of stenosis is high. TAVIs have just been approved. To quote NICE guidance from April 2012, transcatheter aortic valve implementation may be an alternative to surgical valve replacement in patients for whom a conventional aortic valve replacement is not suitable or who are at very high risk. The procedure is performed through a tube, which is usually inserted into a large blood vessel at the top of the leg or elsewhere. This is the transluminal approach. Through this tube, a replacement valve is inserted and deployed over the faulty native valve. Medical management is reserved for those unwilling or unfit for intervention and is generally ineffective. In aortic regurgitation, the key parameter is the left ventricular ejection fraction. In symptomatic patients or asymptomatic patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 55% or end systolic dimensions of more than 55 mm, medical management is an option for mild symptoms of heart failure. Procedures include valve replacement and valve repair, the latter of which is generally reserved for some cases of bicuspid aortic valves, which have regurgitation, and those less fit for replacement. An interesting point worth mentioning is the ROS procedure. This is where the patient's normally pulmonary valve is removed and used to replace the diseased aortic valve. The pulmonary valve is then replaced with a pulmonary homograft. The pulmonary valve is anatomically very similar to the aortic valve. This is an option in younger patients who would like the valve replaced without being on lifelong anticoagulation, as is necessary in mechanical valves, or having to have another operation in 10 to 15 years, as is necessary in biological valves. So, here is an example presentation. I examined Mr. Smith's cardiovascular system today. From the end of the bed, he looked comfortable at rest. The positive findings on peripheral examination were a pulse of 66 that was slow rising as palpated at the carotid and a narrow pulse pressure of 134 over 115. On palpation of the precordium, there was a non-displaced heaving apex beat and a thrill over the aortic area. On auscultation, there was an ejection systolic murmur heard loudest over the aortic region. The murmur was louder on expiration and on performing the Valsalva manoeuvre. Relevant negatives included the absence of any signs of heart failure, as evidenced by the comfort at rest, the clear lung bases, the lack of a third heart sound, and the lack of peripheral edema. There was no signs of infective endocarditis, as evidenced by the lack of relevant signs in the nails or hands. In summary, this is a patient with an ejection systolic murmur, supporting signs suggesting aortic stenosis. Well, hope that's helpful. Please do send feedback to the big crunch at drcrunch.co.uk and also keep visiting drcrunch.co.uk for SBAs and OSCE videos. You can see clinical science on our YouTube channel, Dr. Crunch Videos. Thanks very much. See you next time.